Hello and welcome to DCTV's Primaries Edition of Candidate Conversations. I'm Michelle McRae, Member Services Coordinator here at DCTV. Today I'll be speaking with your candidates for Delegate to the House of Representatives, Mayor, City Council Chair, and other City Council hopefuls from Wards 1, 3, and 5. As a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, DCTV will ask each candidate the same questions. We will allow about five minutes per response. Here are the candidates for Ward 1 Member of the Council. Today we have Salah Sapari, and he's running for the office of Ward 1 Council Member. Salah, what is your vision for Ward 1 and our city's future, and what will you do as the Ward 1 council member to achieve that vision? Thank you. Firstly, thank you for having me. Um, I think there's real anxiety in the city right now uh, about rising crime. We've seen in the last uh, uh, three years a tripling of carjackings. We've seen an overall increase in violent crime up by over 25%. We've seen our, our um, highest vi uh, homicide rate in nearly 20 years last year with over 220 people uh, unfortunately killed. And so uh, what I'm running on is, is a public safety platform. My background um, is at the police department. I was first an officer, actually assigned in Ward 1. Um, I later became a civilian, civilian director at the department and also maintained my status as a reserve officer um, where I ran outreach programs and uh, uh, volunteer programs. I eventually took on recruiting and marketing for the department. And then uh, my last position uh, served in the chief's office uh, under Chief Conti. Um, and so what I think we really need right now in the city is, uh, is to innovate in public safety. Uh, in June 2020, the council cut MPD's hiring um, uh, budget, which resulted in the department losing about 280 officers and detectives. Um, and what, we should have done at that point was invested in all these alternative responses that people ask for, right? Mental health professionals on patrol, other professionals, but we didn't do that. When you call 911, you still only have the option of a police officer or the fire department. And what that's created is now less officers or fewer officers doing more work, and that's not what anyone actually intended for. So what I'm, I'm bringing uh, to this race is my public safety experience. Um, one of the programs I ran uh, when I was at the police department was our domestic violence uh, liaison program. And what that was is we trained civilian volunteers with DC Safe and MPD, and we'd have them ride with police officers on scenes of domestic violence when the scene was rendered safe. Those uh, individuals would then refer victims of domestic violence to services. And we did that because we recognized that you can be the friendliest officer ever, but sometimes that uniform is a barrier. And so my argument here is that if we can do these alternative responses with volunteers, there's no reason we can't do it um, with, paid, with paid individuals. And, and now with 280 less police officers and de detectives, it's even more important that we begin to innovate because we need the police laser focused on violent crime and we need other professionals to be able to meet community members in their times of crisis that are nonviolent. Um, and, and the ideal situation should be that with 280 less police officers and detectives, we should be able to point to the 280 mental health professionals or other professionals that are on patrol, available in the 911 network, um, co-responding and working with the uh, fire department and MPD. Thank you, Salah. Now, what would you do, um, what would you highlight from your past experience that would make you an effective council member to implement your vision and priorities. Definitely, um, like I, I touched on before, uh, my background's in public safety. And I, uh, when I talk to people, nine out of 10 times, uh, crime, gun violence, or just general safety concerns are uh, people's top priority. Um, and part of that is the, the, the problems we face in the city right now are immense. Um, there are many challenges we have to address, but if you can't be safe, walking to school, if you can't be safe walking to work, you can't be safe walking your dog, then suddenly we have to deal with that before we can get to all these other um, issues. And so, uh, like I, I mentioned, I have 
a diverse experience within the police department. And I understand our, our 911 network. I understand our public safety system. And that's really the experience that I'm bringing to, to bear. And um, as I highlighted before, what I believe is imperative that we do is actually fulfill the promises we made in June 2020 to create these alternatives to police response. Because you know, a story that I always tell people when I was an officer was is getting called into a nail salon um, for a customer dispute. The lady uh, who called was irate that they didn't offer a half gel service or some other service. And in the end, it was benign. I, I came in, I told the, uh, uh, the individual who called that, you know, this is really not a police matter, but let me see how I can help. Hopped on Google Ma Maps, found another nail salon, de-escalated the situation and, and, and got her the service she needed. But we really have to ask ourselves, is that something we want the police doing for two reasons? One, in this time of heightened violence, we really need the police focused on uh, violent crime, laser focused on violent crime. And then um, we also, any interaction with a police officer involves at least one firearm, and we know uh, that that changes the dynamics. And so um, part of the other uh, um, experience that I bring to the department is just, or, or to the council is just knowing how our, our system works. Right now, the average uh, homicide suspect in DC has been arrested 11 prior times. So there's something that's not working in our system. And on one side, you know, the, the, their onus falls on the police department to ensure that we're making sure we're building strong cases against uh, violent offenders. And we do that by increasing investigatory capacity and detectives assigned to building those cases. On the other side, there's the prosecution uh, piece, which unfortunately in DC, we don't control our pr prosecution for felonies. It's the U United States Attorney's Office. But if we bring stronger cases, there's a light more likelihood that they're going to uh, be prosecuted. And then also on on the code side, we have to ensure that we're not diverting individuals for age or other factors that really should not be diverted. The idea of diverting someone from arrest is that you don't want someone who is young to now live with this mistake uh, that they made as a young person all their life. And that's a good thing that we should invest in. But when we do divert people, it should be into programming that ensures they get caught up on education, on job training, that they become a productive member of society. Um, both of those two things are gonna take a long time to, to um, figure out. One, increasing investigatory capacity requires training, funding, personnel, that's gonna take time to implement. On the uh, uh, diversion side, <clears throat> part of that is building programming. And the other side is looking at our, and perhaps revising our code to ensure that we're not diverting people that really shouldn't be diverted. Both of those will take time. So in the meantime, we have this great set of data that indicates to us after a certain number of arrests, someone is likely to commit the most violent act, a homicide. And there was a recent study that came out that found that 500 identifiable people are responsible for 70% of the gun violence. So while we're sorting out this uh, building of strong cases, the prosecution, and then also the diversion angle, what we also need to be doing is interjecting into these people's lives all uh, the full gamut of social services that we have. 30% of our city's budget goes to human support services, and we should make, be making these interventions in people's lives right now, catching them up on, on, on education, on job training, helping them get a driver's license and a bank account, removing barriers in the private sector for them so that they can get gainful employment. Because if we really want to see the decrease in violent crime um, in significant numbers over the next 10 and 15, 20 years, we have to make sure everyone has an opportunity to get a good education that leads to gainful employment. Thank you, Salah. Now for our last question, what else would you like voters to know about you or your vision for DC? Yes, definitely. You know, I think... <clears throat> You know, my platform is clearly very much public safety centered. And part of that is because the, uh, like I said before, um, you know, if you can't be safe walking to school, to work, to walking your dog, then so many other things become secondary. But at the same time, public safety is the nexus of so many um, issues because right now, the way our system is set up, we call the police when all the other systems haven't, haven't worked, whether it's um, uh, dealing with uh, mental health, or unhoused neighbors, or just uh, disputes within families that are nonviolent. And so uh, my experience as an officer also uh, brings that to bear on the conversation. 
But, um, you know, the other piece is that um, I, while uh, identity is not my platform, uh, it informs my platform. And if elected, I would be the first Arab American to serve on the council and um, the uh, uh, only sitting member of the council who's openly gay since uh, 2015. And in a city like DC, uh, you know, that's a long time for our community to go without representation. And, you know, part of what the next step is for our, 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 our community and our city is that DC has been a, a safe haven for the LGBTQ community for a very long time. And if we want to maintain that, especially as we see um, um, uh, uh, attacks on the LGBTQ community across uh, the country, uh, we have to ensure that LGBTQ youth who have a much higher likelihood of becoming unhoused and needing mental health care can come to DC, that they have opportunities for long-term stable housing, and that long-term stable housing is also connected uh, with case management for mental health care and other types of health care. Um, and so that's really an, another issue that I, I will push for. And, and that's an issue not just affecting the LGBTQ com com community. We have, unfortunately, a large number of unhoused individuals in the city, and we need to have a compassionate response to them. But we also have to be strategic and recognize if there is a low inventory of housing and that there are encampments that are existing in the city, we have to be able to service them. And it's very hard to service, you know, 100 encampments versus one. Um, and so we should be uh, innovative in how we approach that, making sure we create locations where these encampments can, can exist, that they have bathrooms and showers, and that public and private partners know they can show up there, provide meals and, and other resources. And that way, um, our, our, our social services, our Department of Behavioral Health can also connect people who are unhoused to long-term stable housing as inventory uh, becomes available. Salah, we thank you so much for your time here at Canada Conversations today. Much success to you in your campaign. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Joining us today is Sable Harris, running for the office of Ward 1 Council Member. Hello, Sable. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so for our first question, what's your vision for Ward 1 and our city's future and what will you do as the Ward 1 council member to achieve that vision? Yes, so I am currently serving as advisory neighborhood commissioner for the U Street neighborhood and throughout the time and even my time living in uh, Washington, D.C., I have seen so many opportunities available, whether those are new developments happening, uh, new uh, festivals, businesses coming inside. And although those opportunities are so exciting and they're truly showing the growth of DC and the growth of Ward 1, I've also seen a lot of the gaps that are there. I've seen families displaced from their homes, you know, their rents increasing, not having the jobs that they need, returning citizens coming back with very little to nothing and businesses being forced out because they can't make rent. And so through those gaps, I then decided that it was the time to run and to help fill those for our community and to create those bridges that we so desperately need between community members to create that better vision for Ward 1. Great. Thanks for that response. Now, what would you highlight from your past experience that would make you an effective council member to implement your vision and priorities? Yes, well, thank you for asking that. That is a great question. Um, so with my time as advisory neighborhood commissioner, I have gotten a deep dive into how DC local government works, how different agencies function and who to call upon uh, for varying issues and um, kind of solutions. But with my um, career experience, I have worked at a number of 
small businesses seeing the operations, seeing uh, the margins and how, um, you know, how hard it is to run a small business. And then I've also had the opportunity to build technology companies from the ground up into multi-million dollar organizations. And there are a lot of uh, differences in running those day to day, but there's a lot of similarities, especially when we look at the data and the insights and how to apply that to, you know, even with my uh, ANC role in ensuring that, okay, if I am working with an agency, if I am uh, understanding what the path forward is, how to check in on if things are working and if they aren't working, and then how to immediately course correct from that. We're seeing issues take years to solve or buildings or rental assistant uh, being held back a lot by red tape. Uh, we have the, the insights in front of us to say, this is how we can fix things immediately instead of waiting and reacting to problems that surface. I truly believe that with my career experience that I'm ready to take on and to push forward those proactive solutions so we don't keep finding ourselves in this vicious cycle. Yes, thank you. For our final question, Sable, what else would you like voters to know about you or your vision for DC? Yes, so something that I um, often don't uh, talk about, but it, it is deeply ingrained in who I am as a person and really how I approach uh, my vision for Ward 1 is with my family story and my roots. So my, my mom, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncle uh, fled Vietnam in 1975 on a boat as refugees and made it into the U.S. several months later, uh, really with the hope that they could stop surviving and start thriving. And I think that story rings true for many families here in Ward 1, whether they are just coming to the U.S. or they have been living here for decades. We're seeing where families are trying to survive, making it, you know, month to month, uh, barely paying rent, we're seeing families struggle with understanding our complex healthcare system who, you know, English is not their first language. Uh, we are seeing families scared and terrified of, you know, wondering when the next instance of violence is going to occur on their street. And, you know, we have a chance. We have a chance to implement policy, but also make sure that we're humanizing it and we're connecting it to the individuals that need it most. And I truly believe everyone has a chance, an equitable chance to start thriving as long as our elected leaders, and I hope to be one, are working for the community. That's great. Sable Harris, running for the office of Ward 1 Council Member. Thank you so much for carving out time and thank you for your work in the community. Much success to you from us at Candidate Conversations on DCTV. Thank you so much for having me. We have joining us today, Council Member Brienne Nadeau, and she is running for the seat of Ward 1 Council Member. Welcome, Brienne. Hi. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started with the first question. What's your vision for Ward 1 and our city's future? And what will you do as the Ward 1 Council Member to achieve that vision? Well, um, as the Ward 1 Council Member for the past eight years, I'm really proud of the work that we have done as a community whether that has been focusing on building more than 1,200 units of affordable housing right here in Ward 1, whether that's been modernizing our schools so that our children have safe, dignified places to learn, or investing in our kids through the per-pupil enrollment and all of the after-school and summer programs that I've helped create 
through the out of school time program. These are all beautiful things. Um, but it's also true that now we need to be coming together around the issue of public safety. Um, when I became council member eight years ago, there were actually zero dollars invested in the ward in violence prevention. I learned uh, when I took office that there had been major disinvestment in these programs in our ward. So I worked incredibly hard each year to get more and more funding for our community so that now we have nearly $1.5 million annually for violence prevention and other public safety measures here in Ward 1. Um, and I work together not only with those um, contractors who are working to prevent violence, but also the police and all of our youth serving organizations to make sure that we can um, address the public safety issues that we've been having most recently here in the ward. Great, thanks Brienne. What would you highlight from your past experience that would make you an effective council member to implement your vision and priorities? Sure, well, I think that I have a proven track record as council member, you know, whether it is taking the lead on the largest investment in housing that the district has ever had to end homelessness through the um, Homes and Hearts Amendment that I passed last year, whether it's reforming our public assistance program to ensure that families in need don't fall off a fiscal cliff um, for their benefits, whether it is making our roads safer for all users, pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers. Um, I've really been at the forefront of all these issues, not only for Ward 1, but across the district. I'm really proud of the work that I've done with families, with seniors, with people with disabilities. And before my time on the council, I was also on the neighborhood commission and working with neighborhood associations, um, helped start the U Street movie series back in the day. Um, and there's not a block party I've ever met that I didn't like. Um, really that deep community engagement is a huge piece of the work that I do as council member. One of the things that's really important as a ward council member in particular is constituent services. Now, this is something that is a big priority for me. Over the past eight years, we've closed more than 8,000 cases for our constituents. You know, simple things like helping get the trash picked up or big things like helping people get their unemployment benefits. In the past year alone, we closed more than 2,000 cases because the pandemic has been hard on people. Um, and so my office is there, I'm there helping people with their issues and also just being out in community with folks, whether it is my monthly community office hours or our big public safety events or you know, being at the ANC or the civic associations, being out in community is a really big piece of the work that I do. And it also informs the work that I'm doing on the dais. Some of the best ideas that I've been able to put into law have come from my constituents and have come from me being out in community, listening to their voices about what they want and they need from their government. Sounds like extraordinary work, Brienne. Thank you. So what else would you like voters to know about you and your vision for DC? Sure. Well, as a mom of two little ones here in Parkview, um, that really guides my work. I think about the future that our kids in DC have, not just mine, but all the children that I serve, whether that is the environment, whether that's safe streets, whether that's public safety and freedom from violence or access to a good education. These are the things that I get up in the morning thinking about um, and through the lens of a parent that I deeply, deeply understand how all of our policies impact families. So that's my guiding light. Um, you know, I've always focused my efforts on our most vulnerable residents as chair of the Committee on Human Services. My, my big priority has been ending homelessness. And even though we still see people outside struggling with homelessness, it's really important for folks to know that because of the legislation I passed last year through the budget, we now are able to house 2,400 households a year more than we ever were. We are able to end homelessness for 2,400 more households 
which is the largest investment that we've ever had. And of course, the best way to end homelessness is through housing. So always keeping that lens of a parent, of my focus on residents most vulnerable, um, that's how I do my work here in Ward 1. I'm really proud of all the things that we as a community have accomplished together in the ward, the things that I've been able to lead on, and I think that we have more work to do together. Councilmember Brianne Nadeau, we thank you for your time, for the work that you're currently doing in the community, and much success to you continuing your campaign. Thank you so much. We thank all the candidates for joining us. The District of Columbia will be holding its primary elections on June 21st, 2022. We'll see you this fall ahead of the general election in November. For DCTV, I'm Michelle McRae.